So welcome to the program uh, level SLO and assessment plan workshop. I'm Kim. And because this is a, a smaller group, I want to make sure that you ask a lot of questions, interject anything, comments are always welcome uh, for these type of workshops. So we're going to be talking about program level SLOs and assessment plans, which is a little bit different than course levels. You all have been working on your course uh, assessment plans, so let's try to think program level. So basic introduction. One of the things when you start to think at the program level, you have to think more than just this is just a collection of courses and things. You need, what do you want the students to know and do when they leave your program? Now, for the nursing department, it's going to be a little bit easier than for physical education because you have to understand what kind of students you're capturing. Are you capturing your majors? Are you capturing general education students? You know, what is it that's important for the department to look at at their program level? ESL, because you have a variety of different tracks that they go through or areas of concentration or whatever. Um, you have to define those, that out for everybody. So it's just not taking the outcomes from all these various courses and lumping them all in and making a program assessment plan for all of this. It's a, a little bit wider that. But you want to th think about how does your program prepare your student for the next level, be that the next level in the college, the next level at a university for transfer, or into the workforce. So that's what you need to be thinking, a little bit broader, more globally. Um, what do you provide for the student? What do you want them to know or do when they leave the program? Okay, the purpose of doing these kind of assessment plans is to provide you with some type of system so that you can um, talk about, as faculty, talk about the learning that's going on in your program, the impact your program is having, both positives and perhaps areas that maybe need some refinement. So this is basically trying to have some type of written plan in place so that you can um, have these kinds of discussions. Now, all of this is part of our the college's broader program review process. The outcomes assessment will provide you evidence that you will be citing in your program review process, which then goes moves on forward into the decision making for budget and facilities and personnel and all of this. So it's all linked together. And having this type of written assessment plan then can provide you with that type of documentation, provides you with the structure for um, the discussion and dialogue. It helps you manage. Um, and one of the things here that's very nice is if a key individual leaves, you still have a plan in place so that the department keeps moving forward, the program keeps moving forward and all of this. There's a lot of information here. Stop me if you want me to clarify something or if you have an insight that is missing from all of this. So what this is talking about is the alignment of the outcomes with the program review process here at the college. The first thing you need to differentiate is between what is a department and what is a program. You would think that they are the same, but no, they're not the same. Uh, in some areas they may be, but in most they won't. The department is the, for lack of a better term, the organizational management part of the department. It's your facilities, it's your personnel, it's your budget. And I believe all of you have put in, whether you know it or not, your department has put in program review, a mission statement, and all that information for your department. That is already in our database, and that was done last year. Now, your program has to do with the curriculum part of your department. So the program um, instructional the instructional curricular part of this. Um, and that's what you do your outcomes assessment on. You're assessing the SLOs for that. Does that make sense? To every it's a nuance, but it's important so that you understand the language, so when people ask you for certain things, you understand what's going on. 
A department may have several programs within a department. A department may just have one program in a department. Physical education just has one program. And it's also called the physical education department. So that's, okay? You have two, that's right. You have two, even though it's one department. See, there you go, you're getting the hang of this. Okay, mission, goals, and programs. These mission statements, you will have a mission statement for your department, which is the overall, but you also are gonna need a mission statement for your programs, okay? You've got two programs. Remember we talked about the Learning Center, the ESL Learning Center? It's gonna have a mission statement, but then the ESL program is gonna have a mission statement too. ESL so has two. You would not, so you would not call tracks the program, programs. ESL is a little bit more complicated <laughs> because of the nature of the, of the way it is organized out. The way the college has organized ESL out is that you have two programs. You have an ESL program and you have the so ESL Learning Center. Now with it, and supplemental learning. Uh, no, 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 no. No, now, within the ESL program, you have your different tracks, okay? But you also have the ESL Learning Center, which requires a separate assessment plan. And that's what you were working on before, okay? ESL is a little bit more complicated because you're sort of hybrid, you're called what a hybrid program because you have an instructional program, plus you have the Learning Center, which is, provides service, to all of that. And are you talking, the department for us would be nursing? Right. And well, you're you're in health you're in uh, LVN. In LVN. You're you're in VN. Yes. R you're R RN. Two different departments. But then what about um, you have? Yeah. Um, one program, the VN program. Okay. Okay. And you said what about uh, like um, the MA D, uh, DMI? That's all under allied health. So those are the is department of. What's our department then? The end. And what's our program? The end. So we're all inclusive, just one. And then the RN, we yeah. have two. What's the two? Our career ladder and our registered nursing. You have LVN to RN, and you have RN. Oh, so they have, okay. I didn't two. realize that. Okay. Yeah, and I'll show you where this is all listed in case you know, if you want more nuance on all of this. But now don't confuse courses, because you were talking about the MA courses and, and all of those other, those are courses that are managed by another department. You just happen to have students who take those courses. Right. We're talking, now remember, we're talking about your program. Okay. Program. So I, I would recommend that you would just focus on your required courses for our your program. program. Okay. Like that. Now, but each of your programs need to have a mission statement because they're the instructional components. So you're going to have, in, in our database, you're going to have a mission statement for your department and then a mission statement for the program, which is the instructional curricular component of all of this. And then your programs are also going to have SLOs, which we're going to talk about today. Outcomes. What do you want them to know or do when they leave your program? <sighs> Once you get the language down, you're okay. Everybody all right? Okay, cool. Now. On a broader level, I want you to understand at Long Beach City College, at all the colleges that are assessing SLOs, there are three levels that we are assessing. The course level, you all know about the course level because we've been doing course assessment plans. Today we're talking about the program level because we're going to be creating program assessment plans for our programs. And then be advised that the institution is assessing learning outcomes here. Um, I don't know if you know, we have general education outcomes. And we're going to be assessing the general education outcomes and our plan A, our associate's degree, in a variety of different ways to take a look at how the institution is doing as a whole for all of this, okay? So that's another alignment access that you need um, to be aware of. And so here's just a visual flow chart of all of this. You have your courses. We have a variety of different courses. We have GE and transfer type of courses. We have occupational and developmental courses. All of these courses are going to have course SLOs. So they're all going to have assessment plans. We're going to be assessing at that level. All of our courses all align with a pro some program somewhere. And our programs are going to have SLOs. We also have instructional program outcomes that all of these courses can align with. General education outcomes that I mentioned before are part of this, is a part of this. But then all of this links to the mission of our college, which is the whole big 
alignment of all of this. Everything needs to be late. We do not want to have a course just floating out here, not attached to anything. We do not want to have a program just sort of floating out on its own. Not everything needs to align and dovetail um, into uh, everything else. And everything ultimately goes to the mission of our college. The whole point of why we're here, the mission of our college. So everything then filters down in. Does that make sense? OK? So there is all this alignment that is going on for all of this. Now, one way we're going to align, I'm not going to go over this a lot right now, is that but once we get our program level outcomes, we're going to be doing as an instructional faculty at the college something called curriculum mapping so that we can actually trace the alignment of all the courses and the programs and everything up through and around and together. And that's what all of this is. How do your program SLOs link to the college's instructional program outcomes? Um, and then we're going to show how those outcomes lead to the college's mission. In fact, we've already done that. Um, and so, and then, like I said, at the institution level, we're going to have the general education outcomes, the plan A courses, the GE philosophy. We've aligned all of that already. So there's a lot of alignment going on. So there's always a thread going through. There's a logical thread that links things together because we just don't want, like I said, things floating out there making no sense. Everything needs to make sense. So that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. Hopefully, we'll get started on it this year as we get things up and running. OK. These, this is why it's so good to have this kind of visual alignment and do this kind of work. And it will help you with all of this. And you can see it works. It helps the students. It helps the faculty. It helps the institution. It works at multiple levels. Um, for this, for courses and programs and student learning. And it's just to make sure that it answers a lot of questions. Okay? All right. Now let's talk about program SLO assessment, student learning outcome assessment. There are two really great reasons why we should be assessing student learning outcomes at a program level. The first one you can see is it's a way to document best practices. What's going well, what works, um, what is um, you know, developing and creating, and it provides faculty within the discipline to talk about the pedagogy, the curriculum, in, in some type of structure. So that's one really great thing that can come out of this process. Another um, item that is very, very helpful is to provide better evidence on outcomes. One of the things that um, I don't know if you've heard of the ARC data, A-R-C-C. -C. This is the required um, evidence and data that the, the chancellor's office mandates for every community college. But these are very broad measures. Um, what's your transfer rate? What is your FTEs and your WISH? How many certificates do you confer as an institution? Things like that. Those are very broad measures. And that's, and that's what we call achievement data. And, and that's one way. But it really, that information doesn't tell the whole story about what's going on here and in the instructional side of our college. The program level assessment of student learning outcomes will help us get that more granulated evidence so that we can provide context for these broad measures so that we can really tease out what's going on in our programs and the, and the learning that is transpiring. Or if something's not working, we can figure out why it's not working and then improve student learning, which is the whole point of assessment of student learning outcomes. So program level assessment can provide some very interesting and engaging opportunities for faculty, for students, for staff, for the administration, for management, you know, for all of us to work together to try to improve student learning, thus student success that we're, we're all here for. And that's what we're talking about here. Okay? You guys doing all right? Okay. Okay. Defining a program. It's cumulative learning. It's not pick an outcome from this class, pick an outcome from this class, pick, oh, okay, thus we have a program. You need to step back and think a little bit more broadly about what is the cumulative learning you want that student to walk away from when they finish your program. Um, like I said right here, it's holistic mastery of the, the knowledge and the skills. 
Rudy, we had talked about before about how um, that uh, ESL is more like a hybrid program, and I said it was a little bit different. It's because here we started out with using our curriculum guides. Our curriculum guides contain our degrees and our certificates. So you want to make sure that the outcomes that you're identifying capture that information. But we started with the curriculum guides, and then for any of the more um, difficult areas, uh, difficult being a good thing uh, in all of this, then we, we put together all the pre-collegiate, non-credit, standalone type of courses, hybrid programs, like for example, our library is a, considered a hybrid program. They have an instructional component, but they also have a service component that they provide to the college. So they're considered a hybrid program. And then we have cross-curricular programs. Um, honors would be a cross-curricular program. Work experience would be considered, because they have, um, they span a variety of different, different disciplines here at the college. So we have different, but by doing this configuration, we've captured everything we hope, in all of this. So I think we're, we're pretty much there. So basically, it's your curriculum guides. So, um, and for those that don't have curriculum guides, then we've made accommodations for all of those. So basically, we're going by your curriculum guides, OK, and all of this. So here are a little bit more specifics, just so that you understand how we got to the definition that we got at, because that's our foundation. And then you can build on that. But basically, what I just told you is this slide right here. Does this make sense to everybody? OK? Great. All righty. Next. All right. You want to make sure that when you're thinking about your program and how you're going to assess the students that are going through your program, you want to make sure that you're thinking about all the stakeholders. Because this information can be used, obviously, for the faculty and the students in the, um, within the department and the program. But also, it might be important for the community, too. Um, advisory committees um, for the, work, the uh, vocational area. Um, we want to make sure that your mission and your SLOs are published so that all the stakeholders, not just the faculty, are aware of them. That's why we're going to be um, placing program mission statements and SLOs on the curriculum guides for the next year. We're, going, um, we're recommending that if you have a program website, that you put this information on your program website, any other official material um, at the program level, just so that everybody is aware of you know, what our outcomes are and what our purpose is here for our programs. OK, here's the entire outcomes assessment process. Five steps. This is the five column rubric, right? That you, have you all done an assessment plan for a course so you know what the five column rubric is? I see some heads bobbing. Yeah, like that. OK. okay so it's, it's very similar but a little bit different at the program level. But the steps are the same. You have to identify your SLO. You have to identify your assessment task on how you're going to assess that SLO. You identify your criteria. What these first three columns in the, um, in the assessment plan are, that's your plan. That's your plan. Once you, and that's what we're, we want you to start to produce now and get in so we can get started collecting evidence. Once you collect the evidence based on your plan, then you'll be able to report out results and take some actions to improve student learning and then reestablish the next cycle that you're going to be doing this. So this becomes a continuing, ongoing process. OK. To do this, at the, particularly at the program level, requires some preparation. This is not something, this is a lot. It has been my experience that some people will approach this as paperwork. This is just paperwork. I need to fill out the paperwork and get it in. That you are all here today in the summertime indicates you don't have that mindset. And kudos to all of you. But it do, this whole process does require some preparation. To help you with that, um, here are some items that you really should be thinking about as faculty within a department. Time and organization. 
consulting and research, researching information as possible. In fact, um, I will use the physical education department as an example. When I came over and talked to all of you guys before, there were several members of your department that had researched some assessment tools for physical education performance and fitness testing tools and things like that. And they had done that kind of research so that they could determine what would be an appropriate assessment tool uh, for all of that. So th that kind of information in discipline specific research um, may be helpful. You have to think and plan before you write this stuff down. This is not something that you can just wing. It needs to be thoughtful. Because remember, our outcomes process here is based on the three M's. It needs to be meaningful. If it doesn't give you information to help you improve student learning, then that's not right. It needs to be measurable. We have to be able to measure what we say we, you know, the students are learning. And it needs to be manageable. Okay? If, if it's too much time, it requires too many resources, if, it's, if it, you're fighting it all the time, then that's not right either. So the three M's, meaningful, measurable, manageable. If you're finding that one of these isn't working, then it's, the process isn't working, then you need to change it because it needs those things. That's the basis for all of this. So you can see that a lot, some of this planning, there's a little upfront loading of time and effort and all of that. Resources, developing the process, thinking about it, you're thinking about your purpose and your goals for your program. All of this will help you establish you know, what, what you really want for the students you know, to learn and develop as they go through your program. So it does take some preparation. Now, then you can go on to develop your plan. And that's the first three columns in the program assessment plan document. OK? So there it all is. Let's go into each one of these. Here's a visual. Do you remember? This is a visual of the assessment plan, right? It looks familiar. If you've done the courses, it's the same thing. You have the outcomes here, the assessment task with all of the prompts and then the criteria with all of the prompts. Then you start to collect the evidence before we go here. But this is all that we need to get done right now to get it started. Okay, and that's what we're asking for right now. Okay? Column number one, the SLOs. Here again, focus on a few key learning outcomes. We're recommending two to five per program. The, the more you do, the more you do. <laughs> Okay, so that seems to be a re reasonable range that we're recommending. Third bullet down, it's impossible to measure everything. Please just buy into that right now and, and you will make your life a whole lot easier. But what are the essential learning that you want a student to go away from for this? Definitely knowledge and skills possibly attitudes and values. But I am going to give you a caveat. If you really put down an attitude or value learning outcome, you have to be able to directly measure it. And it, say it. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard to directly measure a student's attitude or value in this. It can be done. And there are tools out there that can do this. And if this is truly essential, for your program, then absolutely you should include it and embrace it and, and delve into this. Okay? But I just did want to give you a, a word of caution. But absolutely all of these categories are um, appropriate. Okay. SLOs continue. These are broader statements. You're not going to write these statements as specific as you would for the course level just by the nature. You're trying to look at integrated skills, not just one specific skill, not just one specific topic. You're looking at more of the integrated nature of things. So instead of, now this is totally off, but you know how in a golf class you have, you know, you putt, you swing, you drive, bunker shot, you know, okay. But at the end of the class, you want them to be able to play around the golf, right? Okay, that's at the course level. At the program level, it would be something very similar to that. But I just saw you, and I knew you're a golfer, and so I thought about that um, for all of that. Does that make sense? It's integrated. It's the integrated nature of the skills in the nursing program. 
you, you have them go through each course, right? But at the end, they need to be able to be a nurse. They're integrating all those skills. They're synthesizing all those skills together. Their communication skills, their physical skills, their knowledge bases and all of that to be a nurse in a work environment. Let's say something like, it's the integration of the skills. So with the golf game, <laughs> what, what is the, pro if, if the course goal is to be able to play a game of golf, what would be different with the program? Well, the program just doesn't do golf. Oh. The program has many different classes. Yeah, tennis, golf, golf right. badminton. Yeah. Yeah. And and then here again, you guys have to decide how you're going to divide your curriculum up for all of this. And and this is all the, the planning process and all of that. Okay. Like I said, two to five. Um, now, development options. There are different ways you can approach this, which is what we're, you were talking about right now. Different ways that you can approach this. I got another slide on that one too. General rules. You need approval by most faculty to need to buy into the program. You see, I see most. Unanimity is not a goal here. Consensus is. Okay. Um, let's see. You, this one is important too. At least one distinct program level SLO must be identified for each program. We have several departments that have multiple programs in the department, and they're very, the programs are very close and similar. But because they are distinct programs, they need to have at least one distinct SLO. I can see where an SLO might be relevant for several programs within a department. But if that's all you have, then there's no reason to have distinct programs. You need to have at least one distinct SLO for each program. Then you may have common ones across the board within a department. It's but hard in ours because they both will. You're going to be the exception. You know, like yeah, every rule, you need to have to, so you're going to be the exception to the rule because of your outside licensing agencies yeah. and all of that. Absolutely. So yes, you're beautiful. The exception to the rule is sitting right here. So, there you go. You're so exceptional. All righty. Development options. Now, here are some ideas on how you can approach program level. You might want to begin with a major. Remember I said you had required courses and recommended courses? You may just want to focus on the required courses. If these are required, then everybody's got to take them. Then you may just want to assess the integrated learning based on those required courses. That's one approach to all of this. Begin with the capstone course or experience. This is the nursing department because you guys are sequential, right? And you, you have first semester courses, second semester, third semester, fourth semester. Well, your first semester, that's your culminative, that's your capstone, right? So for you, that, that would be your route, I would think, that you may want to take. And then take that capstone course experiences and then that's where, that's basically the program experience for all of this. Um, areas of concentration, Rudy, S, um, ESL, right? You have different areas of concentration. You have the vocational route. You have, I think, what were they telling me? The pre-academic. Pre-academic and the academic. Okay, you have areas of concentration. You might want to have an SLO in each one of these areas of concentration. Um, if you have certificates in your program, you got to make sure the the SLOs capture the learning that goes on in the certificates. You may want to, you know, with two to five SLOs, you may want to have a couple of SLOs for the degree part. You may want to have a, an SLO for the certificates that you know you give out. I, you know, there's a lot of latitude in all of this, but it's how you think about your program for all of this. Um, tracks of study. So begin with the courses. Um, find commonalities and all of that. The way some programs are and the type of courses they have, you may want to find some commonalities. PE, like in the PEG and all of those, you may want to find the commonalities because it's really hard to with PEG, you know, the difference between volleyball and badminton and all of that. So then you may want to try to find commonalities and then have an outcome for PEG, PEPF, PEIA, and stuff like that. You may, you may not want to do it that way. That's, that's the faculty's choice. Or you can begin with a curriculum map. I talked about how you draw out all your courses and how the thread all links to everything. And a lot of times when you produce a curriculum map, you can see things that you hadn't seen before when you get it all visually laid out. And then you can see where the program's outcomes should be 
So it's, it's a little bit different. The development of this is a little bit different than course level. But you have a couple of different avenues to do this with. Once you, now, the second column is your assessment tools. And I'm going to pause right now and tell you to do program level assessment plans, it's probably from the information I'm getting back from faculty, it tends to be easier to develop your outcomes along with your assessment tools simultaneously so that you know how you're going to be assessing the outcomes so that it all blends together quite nicely. It's re you really shouldn't be doing the outcomes, then the assessment tool, then column three. Tends to be more of a holistic approach, works better for program level. We didn't do it that way with the course level because of how we had to get things up and running, but now that we had have a moment, not a lot of time, but a moment, you might want to think about doing this. Look at your assessment tool that you typically would be using for your programs, if it's a portfolio, um, if it's um, a written test in your, in your capstone course or something like that. And then that might inform you as to um, well, how the outcome should be phrased for all of this. OK, assessment tools. Um, like I said, a curriculum map is one really nice assessment tool that you might want to use in all, in all of this. But then also, um, you might want to take a look. Here again, what are their exit knowledge and skills and attitudes when they do this? Are you going to be looking at student development? Some of our programs look at the growth of the student throughout the program. I know. Um, uh, I'm thinking of another department that is going to do this in their program, and so they're going to follow and track their students as they grow and develop, and assess them accordingly instead of at the you know and look at you know where they started and then their accumulation of knowledge. Um, is there a specific program-specific learning, and that's where a pre and a post test might come in. Our library technician program is going to be doing that. They're going to be giving them an exam when they come into the program. Then they're going to take all their course, and then they're going to give them the same exam when they exit and to see what have they learned. And that's very program specific learning. So you have a lot of different ways to do this. Outside agency data, your licensing agency data can be used as an assessment tool. Here again, it's a broader achievement data type of assessment tool. But um, if you have a licensing or testing agency to do that, and I had mentioned the ARC data before, that's college level evidence. Um, we all have access to that through our data depot database that is here at the college through the Office of Institutional Effectiveness. So for the outside agency data, we have our students take an ATI test and the NCLEX exam mm -hmm. for them to become an RN. Is right, that and then the, and you get semester feedback yeah. from them, and you and you could be using those. In fact, when um, I came over and chatted with your area, that was those were some of the things that they were putting in. All right, and so, that. so and that and that is one of the measures. It's not the whole measure because that's not a direct assessment of the learning, but it does provide you with very inf um, good information. Um, Judy did that also with the VNs and stuff so just so that you can wrap your mind around this okay here's some other considerations and i mentioned the term direct assessment direct versus indirect direct assessment of student learning you are looking right directly at, it's not indirect where the student said you ask the student did you learn a lot yeah i learned a lot okay well that's an indirect measure of learning you are directly assessing what do, what do they know and do for all this, how have they demonstrated their knowledge that they have obtained? How have they, how have they demonstrated the skills that they have obtained? That's direct assessment of learning. Um, you can decide, are you going to put this assessment, this program level assessment, in a course, like in your fourth semester final, you can figure out a course where all of this is embedded? Or is this going to be more programmatic assessment? Our music department is um, working with um, jury results and they, they do a lot of jury assessment outside of the courses where the students have to come in and perform and all of that. They're going to be using that assessment information and that's not embedded within a course that is the pro but that's what they're doing for their majors. Our art department, um, they're going to try out their student art show as one of the direct assessment majors but that's not going to be within a course that's going to be outside but they're going to go through they got a rubric and they're going to be grading the art projects that are on display for their higher level students. But that's an example of programmatic. It's not within a course. It's outside of the course. 
Performance versus self-reporting, I talked to you about that, right? You don't want the students to, to even though the student self-reporting can be very informative, it's not direct, and so it needs to be done in conjunction with, and that's what I said down here. Use all direct or a combination of direct and indirect at the program level. That's acceptable. So if you want to do a survey of the students, that's great, but that's an indirect measure. So you also have to have a direct measure along with it. This is just good basic assessment principles that we're trying to follow here. Okay, so here are some examples. Direct assessment measures. Here are some examples that you might want to think about when you do that. Indirect assessment methods. There are more on the outcomes website, outcomes.lbcc.edu. There's more uh, information about this besides in your handout and all of this right now. Okay? Kim? Yes. Um, I don't know if this is something different, but with the SUOs and the Learning Center, uh, you know that we're going to probably put out a survey. Yes. I, think I mentioned that. Yes. Now, is this for every indirect? You need a direct principle applied to learning centers. SLOs. Just SLOs. Only, not SUOs. Okay. Smiles back. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. This is just no indirect measures are perfectly acceptable for SUOs because of the nature of them. Okay. Okay, now column three, along with your assessment tool, <laughs> you need to have criteria and expectations. Um, what is the expected level of achievement that you want for this outcome, this particular outcome? It's, it's, it could be a percentage, a fraction, a number of what it is. Because right now we have no previous assessment evidence, most of us don't have, we're just going to sort of set a benchmark for ourselves at this particular juncture and then see if we're going to hit it or not and then we'll develop our knowledge base better from that point as we move forward for all of this. The success criteria is related to the assessment tool that you're using. What is the minimally, the minimum level of success used on that assessment tool and define that for the success level. And then who will be assessed? You do not have to assess every single student. You may want to. Depends on the number and the size. So here are some information. What do you find informative? What would you, as a program, find informative for you to assess? Remember, that's that M, that meaningful one that we were talking about. You decide. You can see, I'm hoping, that faculty make a lot of decisions and have a lot of choices and have a lot of flexibility built within the structure of this process. Um, quick yep. question. Um, in the case of my discipline, to write an effective assessment, essentially what you do is you produce some sort of tool that is native speaker level. In other words, mm -hmm. if you do it within an ESL program, probably no one will get 100% on the assessment. That's OK. But OK, so. Realistic, real world. Right. But what I guess what I'm thinking is in terms of, let's just say it's three years down the road, somebody opens up the files and says, oh, your students were only getting 60% on their exit assessment. What's going on in your department? I don't think anybody's going to come in and say that. I'm hoping that the faculty says that to themselves. You know, we had um, a benchmark of this, but we're only getting 60%. So now you take well, the structure. I'm sure that 60% might be a very good score. If, 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 if the assessment's written, in our case, the way, native, in other words, where only a native speaker who's spoken English their whole lives might get 100 When you report out your results, mm -hmm. we're not going to talk about that today, but in those columns, it provides you for, it has prompts for sections, what, what are your key findings and what are your conclusions, and that's when you explain it, right there. And you explain the rationale and, and all of that. Okay. So everything's documented, and, and like I said, this provides for that more granulated analysis so that it makes sense to people. So if you report out your results correctly and clearly, you probably wouldn't have this scenario that somebody says, well, why is it this way? Because you would have all that information already in your assessment results, reporting out, and what actions you took, and things like that. So it all should be there. But if somebody finds something that's really, then I would hope that somebody would come back and say, oh, you know what? We saw this in your, in your results, and we want to share information. And I'm thinking, 
pie in the sky, you know, interdisciplinary dialogue going on and, you know, and sharing information, you know, about student learning across the disciplines, not only just within the disciplines, but across the different programs, you know, so that we can learn from each other and stuff. And this is when the um, teaching and learning center that's being developed right here, this is where a lot of those dialogues will be hopefully taking place and we'll have a place that we can talk as professional faculty and have these kind of exchanges. Okay, so who will be assessed? What kind of assessments? Like I said, you may want to take all of them. I think the nursing department decided they could take all of them because you can do that. You may just want program completers. You may want to look at all the students that started the program and if some didn't, you know, if you want to follow up with them and find out why and this and that. You can do a pure random sample. You can do a representative sample with some suggestions. You decide of what's, you know, relevant and meaningful for your department. Now, management of the program assessment plan. Like the courses are linked to the course review cycle, the program assessment plan is going to be linked to the program review cycle. Um, so you need to co complete assessing all of your program SLOs at least once within that three-year cycle. That is our program review cycle. In fact, as I'm talking about this, I would like to suggest you actually get it done the spring semester before your program review is done so you will have assessment evidence sitting there for you to use when you have to complete your program review. They ha uh, the program review subcommittee has created a three-year cycle and it has been published. I'll show it to you if we have time and, and get you that information so you know exactly when your programs are due. But you want to collect evidence up and report out Prob probably that spring semester before the fall semester that the program review is due. Hopefully, then we have a nice little flow and we can keep this ongoing as we do this. So it does take some management. It does take some planning to do this. This is why um, the Academic Council voted to have SLO officers in, in the departments because this is a lot of internal management and so uh, they were hoping to get that pilot project up and running so that p specific individuals can be trained to help the, their colleagues in each of the departments to do this. Okay, cost and time, be prepared to compromise. It, that, manageable, that M, the manageable M, right? And that's real life. Reporting occurs in TrackDAT. You've all heard of TrackDAT? So, TrackDAT is our purchase database that we're using to capture program review and outcomes assessment information. Let me just say right now, it doesn't count until it's in TrackDAT. Okay, that's our new rule. And so, so it's great that you all sat around and talked about all of this and you wrote down a few little things and you have it on the side of somebody's file cabinet somewhere. That's all great. But it doesn't count unless it's uploaded into TrackDAT so it can be used, so you can use it, so other faculty can, you know, see, so, you know, so we can all use it, okay? Okay, these, this whole process and these plans, I hope you've gotten the flavor that this is a dynamic and ongoing process. It provides you with the structure so that you can have the discussion and the dialogue you need to analyze the student learning that is going on in your program and so that you can improve that student learning. Find out what's going right. What is really going, that's an important part of all of this. Find out what needs to be tweaked. Find out how you look at your students. Um, I was just talking to our speech department last semester and they were talking about majors versus general education. Which one is more important to them? Are they both equally important? Things like This is a conversation that they really hadn't had consciously in a, in a while and so they were very open um, to that kind of dialogue and then that informed how they would develop their assessment plan for all of this. You can always revise. Okay, Any assessment that you're doing is good. It can help and we just build on what we're doing and what we have. We are going to report out your results, your analysis, any, and the specific actions you have taken for the next cycle as we go through. Um, there's continuous refinement to student learning because that's why we're here. I keep hearing everybody say we're here for the students and this is a way we can document how we are here for the students and helping the students 
make it through and move on with their lives. Okay? All right, take a breath. You all all right? Yeah. <laughs> all that. Um, we have a little bit of time. I didn't know if you, you've had some really good comments and some really good questions. I didn't know if um, with the presentation, if there was anything that you had another question or comment on. Okay, good. Now, in front of you with your handouts, besides the handout that was for the um, PowerPoint, you have that to take with you. I'm also providing you with some examples of program SLOs that um, we took from Consumnist River College. There are other community colleges that have their outcomes posted on the website. But this is just to give you sort of a flavor of um, what you should be um, thinking about and you know that more integrative type of learning. So please feel free to take that along with it. Um, Sorry, you said these outcomes came from other programs? So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Because some this river, river, uh huh, and then um, I know Orange Coast College has theirs up on the website too. Good for them, and eventually Long Beach City College will be having theirs. We have a start. If you don't know that, we already have our SUOs and our SLOs as of March. Any programs that were submitted, they are on our college's website. Service unit outcomes for the services that the college provides to students and faculty and other stakeholders. Okay. So when we're talking about being a good educational institution, we're looking at the instructional, the instructional as well as the service side of the college too. Okay. So any of that I had mentioned. Okay. So everybody good with that? Okay. I did mention that we have the outcomes website, and I always take an opportunity to highlight this website just to make sure that you, everything we talked about in here, all the documents and everything, are available on this website. The website, like I said before, is outcomes.lbcc.edu. But if you really can't remember that, take a look here. If you go to faculty and staff, and you click on faculty and staff, and you can see we have two categories here, faculty and staff resources and departments. Can you find it? You see it? Outcomes assessment, SLOs and SUOs. Okay, it's under resources. And we also have it down over here under departments, just in case. So it's in both categories. But you click on that, and that takes you to the outcomes page. Your navigation tool is over here on the left-hand side in the gray area. The general information is all up here. Student learning outcomes. Here are your three levels. Course level, program level that we talked about, institution level. Those are your three levels that we mentioned before. We were talking about program level today. So if I click on this, what we need to get done right now, exclamation point, right, is the program assessment plan. There's your template. Here's a PDF training of it. And here's a little PowerPoint that you just went through. So it's all right here for you if you want to share this with colleagues or direct them to this area. That's, but this is the first thing we have to get done. We are hoping that we can get all of our program assessment plans in this next semester and get them up because we need to get them up and start assessment because our first round of program review is due in 2011. That means we have to collect evidence this academic year, 2010-2011. Okay. Now, here, this section has all of the information about the program level outcomes assessment process. This first PDF document here is the complete whole shebang on all of that. But then below it, we have it broken out into different sections. If you want to delve more into the development of SLOs, uh, program SLO examples, the handout I just gave you with the, the samples, that's this right here. Program assessment options, I gave you a few assessment options, direct and indirect right here. A more comprehensive one is right here. If you're thinking about using a capstone assessment tool, for example, the nursing, I've got a, uh, there's some information right here. Um, there's a general checklist to make sure that your assessments at the program level are um, meeting all of the good assessment principles and requirements. Then once you get into the discussion and analysis part, 
Here's some guiding principles and some uh, ideas for you, actions taken, and then as you are evaluating SLO evidence, you know, there's some guiding questions in this document. So there's a lot of support documents here. People just have to go onto the website and click on it. It's there until you sort of get the hang of all of this. Program assessment is tied to program review. Here is the program review schedule. I'll click on this and open this up. Just so that you know, in 2011, these are the, pro the departments and all of their corresponding programs are due. That means these departments right now, they're going to have to start collecting assessment evidence this year at the program level. They have to have their assessment plans in now so they can start doing all of this so that it's all set and in shape so that for next year, next fall, when the program review information is due, they will have something to refer back to and utilize as they do this. Okay? What's, yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah, keep going. I know. I, I'm working on it. Okay. Okay, the same thing for the nursing program. Okay, but you need to start, you actually need to get this in now so you can start collecting up in 2010, 2011, so you give a little bit more assessment evidence because it's going to be due fall 12. Well, we have something due this spring. 2011. You do? We have to report out. Maybe for some of your courses? Yeah. Yeah, probably that's the different. courses. This that's is program different. level. Okay. So, and that's why I said there's a lot of management going on because the instructional side of the house has to manage both the course level and the program level. You've, you've got to be aware of both levels and be able to manage both of those levels. Physical education is this, so the same thing for physical education, getting their plan in. That. And ESL is due in 2012. So I, the people that I spoke with in ESL to develop this plan, you know, it's like um, collecting, reporting out the evidence like by spring 11 so that you will have it all there and it will be ready to go by when you need it for fall 12. Yeah. Okay. And then, then we have the third year. And then this, this cycle will just repeat itself. But the information is there. I know the outcomes website has a lot of information on it, and, you've, and it, it seems a bit daunting. I, I understand that. I'm hoping that um, as the, the faculty and the college gets into this routine, we can start to streamline a few things. Everything will always be here, but we have an archive section, and we'll be putting more things in the archive, I'm hoping, as we get past certain stages, benchmarks for all of this. All the information I talked to you about program definition is all up here. Um, a whole section on curriculum mapping, which is going to be a task that departments are going to um, get to participate in in the future. It's already up here. Here are some of our early adopters and their assessment plans are already up there. Oh look, vocational nursing is already up there. Yeah. So. Um, you may want to take a look at that. But anyway, so we tried to get a nice little variety of um, assessment plans. So examples are already up here um, to help a little bit with that. So that's program level. The only other website page on here that I'd like to draw your attention to is, again, under student learning outcomes, if you go all the way down to assessment, on this assessment page, there is information on rubrics, portfolios, and surveys both um, PDFs, PowerPoints, samples, all of that. We have course samples right here. We have a ton of course samples right here. But we also have one program sample that our social science department is going to experiment with. And so let me open this up. And let me go up a little bit. Just so here again, this is a five level rubric. Our social science department is a very broad department, and it's really difficult to corral them all together. So what they've decided is that they're going to take artifacts from each of the disciplines and then use a common rubric to see. And so it could be a, a speech performance, it could be a paper, it could be a project, but they're, but they're going to collect artifacts from psychology, sociology, economics, geography, and, the, and then they're all going to sit down in a, um, in a collegial discussion, and then they're going to grade. That, and then it's going to tell them about the social science program for all of this. I, I have 
been listening to the child development department. They're thinking about developing a program portfolio. So as the students go through the program, they build their portfolio of work. Um, from and they're going to require certain reflections and, and artifacts and presentations be placed in their portfolio. Then they'll have a work portfolio when they leave. But then also they'll grade that. Possibly, if you have a portfolio, they'll grade it on a rubric. You know, at the program level. Just trying to give you sort of some ideas for all of this. Okay, does that make sense? I, I know, phew, I said there is a lot of planning. No, you know, I'm, and that's why I kept hitting on the manageable. Keep it simple to start out with, it, it's, but it can be changed. It's a dynamic process. It's a, it's a revisionary process. Just as long as it's meaningful to, you know, gives, you know manageable, measurable, Let's do that. Yeah? I know this is a lot of information. This must feel like what students feel like when they get their syllabi right at the yeah. beginning of the semester and you go over the entire semester and all of that. But I want you to know the website is here. The ASLO subcommittee members are here. Their names are on the website. They want you to come and ask them questions. I'm here to help you. Um, we're hopefully getting these SLO officers up and running. They will be here to help you. They're all going to be trained. So you're going to have resources and support um, as we go along. And I'm hoping collegially, as faculty, we can help each other for all of this. I, th I think that would be great. OK, so have I missed anything? You all good for all that? OK, great. 